These last few months have been unbelievably busy with breaking news for the sports card hobby. Just think about all of the big stories that we've heard, such as the card cleaning controversy and PSA's response to people who clean their cards. You also, of course, had SGC being bought by Collectors, the parent company of PSA. You have had production issues from Panini and autographs not making their way into products that were supposed to have autographs. And then you've had fake autographs not get authenticated by PSA, even though they were in certain Panini products. We now have Golden and Card Porn involved in a lawsuit over a card that they refused to sell or that Golden refused to sell. So much, all of this and more. And... There is more big news on the way soon. So I thought that I would bring the source of a lot of this breaking news onto the show today. Darren Rovell, sports reporter Darren Rovell, has connections throughout the hobby, and he was the one who first reported on some of these stories. He's always got the inside scoop, so I wanted to catch up with him on all of these different stories today and get his take. So without further ado, let's welcome Darren Rovell to the Jeff Wilson Show. Darren, welcome back to the show. Good to be here, Jeff. It is always a pleasure to have you on. I always enjoy talking to you. And and by the way, anybody out there who is not following Darren Rovell, especially on Twitter, but also on Instagram and other platforms, you are missing out because he posts all kinds of interesting things that are happening both inside the hobby, but as well as outside the hobby. Anything to do with collecting, sometimes sports betting in other areas as well. And uh, this, uh, the last week, over the last week from when we were recording this, uh, Darren posted about a bunch of movie items that were recently up for auction that sold, including... Uh, one of the original, the original letter from Shawshank Redemption uh, that Andy wrote. Uh, yeah. Was it Andy wrote it to Red? Was that right? Yes. Did I get that right? Andy to Red, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the and 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 now these guys are starting to use photo matched and screen matched because they see what's happened in game worn, and you know, so it's very interesting to see how they're now using those phrases because they know that it will mean more money if they can match it. Yeah, fascinating stuff. You guys have to follow Darren's accounts because he's got fascinating stuff on there all the time. But today I want to talk about the hobby and specifically, Darren, I brought you on. There have been a lot of big news stories over the last few weeks in the hobby, and I thought we would tackle some of these, starting with a controversy around card cleaning. And I'm sure everybody watching knows, you know, what's been going on with Kurt's card care and these card cleaning kits and then and then supposedly the person who submitted the black one of one Victor Webinyama who got a PSA 10 maybe used certain products and and even gave them credit at collector's office then PSA comes out with a statement <laughs> saying saying we couldn't detect them using anything but we also any type of use of these products you know would be considered alt- altering the card I, see, what, I, what? I, I I completely disagree with PSA there yeah, you know, as a longtime collector and, and a follower uh, of the hobby in general, you are generally allowed to do things that are not significantly altering. So trimming, no. Uh, but like restoration, no. Restoration normally includes liquids and other things. But if you're not filling a hole with something, and you're taking these, what Kurt's Card Care has, tools to bump out a something that looks like a hole or something, and you're not adding to the card in any way, whether adding wax or any type of material, I don't think PSA should have a problem with it. Whoever said that the condition that your card comes out of a pack-in should be, that, that has to be what you submit. I, I don't think that's true. So I, I, I think PSA taking a line here, I don't know why they are. I could only imagine it's because maybe they feel embarrassed. But, but if, if I submit a Wembenyama, the one of one, and it gets an eight, and then I crack it out, and then I use Kirk's Card Care's products, 
and and then I get a 10. Now they would know because it's the one of one. But most of the time they wouldn't know uh, unless they're going to use AI to have certain card patterns and say, oh, this was submitted before. It's not an embarrassment because it was an eight. And now it is a 10. Now, I'm not sure it's a 10. That looked like looks like 60-40 centering there. But that's besides the point. I just don't think there's... Uh, PSA is making too much of a big deal out of this. And if it's not liquids and it's literally using tools, I think people in the hobby should be able to make their cards better as long as they're not trimming them or doing things that would be considered taboo like adding liquids or wax. Yeah, that's an interesting way of drawing the line right like you can you can take you can take things away from the card meaning you can clean it you can you know get get marks off of it so to speak if you add to the card that that's when it starts to become a, a bit problematic that's kind of right. what and i'm hearing you also say. say obviously you're taking off the card if you're making a corner better right which is trimming it so I, I i listen we as a hobby have to try to regulate this and we can choose what we think is acceptable or not and i think psa will go along with it now that we have social media and everything else i think we as a hobby can help control what we want and psa will go that way uh but but I, I, I don't think the we do not accept any of these products and touching the card, again, whoever said that whatever comes out of a pack and the condition it comes out of is what you have to settle for, I disagree. And doesn't it create a difficult standard, the fact that PSA is both saying you can't do this, but also we can't detect when you do this, I feel like that creates a little bit of a difficult double standard there. I feel like if it's if it's non-detectable because there's nothing that has been you know left remaining on the card, I feel like maybe they should think about if we can't detect this anyway, maybe we should actually say that that piece of it's okay. But if you're doing something obviously that's altering the card that we can detect, recoloration, trimming, adding substance to it, you know, then we're gonna we're gonna detect that, and then of course it will be altered. That, that's your job. And by the way, if you think about it, PSA is getting more business, making more money by having cards that look better and grading them higher. So do you take, yeah, I agree. Do you take cues from other forms of collectibles? I know that you are, you know, not just a, a, a sports car collector. In fact, you, you largely collect other forms of collectibles. In tickets, tickets are always in scrapbooks. No one's ever said I can't take something off a, a scrapbook and make it better. You know, like, the, uh, so so tickets for sure. Um, I do own some magazines. I've got some magazines cleaned. Um, yeah, and so in magazines, like pressing the magazine pressing. seems to be a common, acceptable very practice. Very common. Very common. Pressing the magazine. It's very common. Let's get this, let's get this wrinkle out or, or whatever. So... Again, I think I, I I don't think that it 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 makes a lot of sense that you can't use it. now. Again, if you're using liquids and other things, I'm out. But but if you're just ha making it better, and by the way, Kurt's card care. I know his stance is this is democratic. Everyone has a chance to do this. Now it's sure it's buy my product, but everyone can do this. It's not like. Uh, there's special, only top people can can get this and learn from this. His videos are fascinating. I can't yeah. believe what he does. Uh, so, but I think the just jamming on him uh, and saying, you know, like, you know, he's getting caught. I, I, I actually think PSA is in the wrong here. Yeah. Now, now, Kurt does probably go a step too far at times. He does do some of the soaking, you know, and that kind of stuff that you're talking about as well. But yes. I'm talking but, about the, um, the, kit, the kit with the tools. Like, okay. Yeah. yeah, I agree. So you think PSA should revise their stance here. Do you, though, think that there's any chance that that actually will happen? Because they seem to be pretty definitive recently when they came out and said, not allowed. Everyone's going to still do it. I mean, they said, they by them just saying we couldn't detect it, that's, a, that's like... Uh, uh, the World Anti-Doping Agency saying you're not allowed to use this drug, but this person said they used the drug and we and we didn't detect it. It's not exactly going to deter people. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm with you. I, I I think that I'm well. First of all, I am glad that PSA was at least transparent and came out with a statement sure. instead of doing what some companies in the hobby do, which is completely ignore it, pretend that like nothing ever happened and never comment on it. So at least they commented on it. I but actually, they com- I actually asked Kurt. I asked Kurt. I said, "Did you was that an ad? Did you put him up to that? Right? Because it seemed like it was was it unnecessarily inserted." Like, so, and he said, no, it was a complete surprise. Obviously I loved it where he was at and what it was. And, but, but he did not, he did not, that was not like any sort of like ad for Kurt, although it seemed to become one and put him, put him under the fire, but, but still gave him a lot of attention. Oh, a ton of attention. I mean, I, I've got to imagine his sales are 10 X uh, today where they were a few weeks yes. ago. I mean, he's definitely on the radar. This, this has to be the best thing that could have ever happened to his business. Yes. I would have to think. Yeah, for sure. So I feel, and this was not my unique idea. I heard other content creators talking about it, but I actually kind of like the idea of PSA switching and saying, okay, cleaning is acceptable, but only with the use of certain types of products. I think PSA should just come out with their own product line here. Like let, ah, let PSA ah. or, or, or offer this as a service. Why not? For an extra eight bucks, PSA will clean your card. And, uh, and you know, I mean, th- think how much, think how much additional revenue PSA could unlock for themselves here. Oh my God. Yeah. Now people will say, oh, that's fishy. You can't do that. Cause then they're grading the card, but they also make money by coming back with your card being worth more money. So, you know, people say that that's not right. They should just grade a card and whatever it comes out like, okay, it's worth more money, but they know that when they grade it higher, that it's worth more money and that it's going to cost you more. So they're in that business already. I think that'd be, maybe, maybe you still have to do it yourself, but, but maybe right. there's a special, uh, you know, PSA, uh, kit that, yep. that they could make for sure. They'd, they'd sell a lot of them. That is yeah. for sure. Yes. All right. Well, let's let's stick with PSA, but shift gears a little bit to the to the PSA and SGC news. Obviously, it was a surprise to me. I don't know if it was a surprise to you or not, but it was a big surprise to me when it was announced a few weeks ago that collectors had acquired SGC. I, I didn't see that coming. I was pretty surprised. I, I, you know, SGC and PSA were pretty bitter rivals, and and I, uh, I, I got I've gotten to know the the leadership over at at really I, at both companies, but maybe SGC a little bit more so. And SGC's leadership, I, they definitely perceived like PSA as a big rival going sure. back even a few months ago. And then all of a sudden now, you know, they're on the same team, they're best friends. And, and uh, what, how did you react to this news? And what does this do? Where does this leave the hobby? So I broke the news. It was Sunday night. Someone called me and said, PSA is acquiring SGC. And I was like, what? Are you sure? That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. I don't think like they, they are, they, they did play the, and obviously if you're an entrepreneur and those guys at SGC had seen a tremendous rise, I didn't see what, what it was other than buying a competitor and can you get away with it and own 80% market share, you know, uh, or 85% market share, whatever it is, the combined uh, and then I, I called a couple people and they said it was true. And I was like, okay, I don't really know why. And, you know, over the past week or two, just figured to, to sniff around. And, and there's, there's really something to be said for the amount of vintage graders that PSA can't get. Um, mm-hmm. there, you know, uh, and, and obviously SGC is crushing it in vintage. So a lot of it is, you know, we feel like we are slow. We're we're behind. Um, we're more behind than people think, and we need to get good people in here right away. So the employee buy kind of makes sense. Um, but but other than like you know, let's try to be the big bad monopoly. I didn't see it coming, and I still don't totally understand it. Well, and the interesting thing is if part of the motivation was an employee buy, that's a little bit contradictory to the public statements that we've seen from SGC, at least, where Peter at SGC came out and said, it's 100% business as normal. The two companies are going to remain completely independent organizations, you know, and this doesn't change anything with either company. But if it was an employee acquisition, you know, type play, well, it will change things. It, it will take some of SGC's talent and shift it to PSA. And where does that leave SGC? And then does SGC have to change their business model at all in terms of, you know, what they're 
able to take on or pricing levels or something like that to you know to change the flow of uh, how they're handling vintage yeah, tra- i mean transparent they they can say that and and f- to us because they're public you know they're publicly acting as sgc and psa um you know i think that we wouldn't be able to tell right unless you know so so to to have guys you know whether they're physically moving or not or if they're grading however they're grading it um, I mean, I was told that was one of one of the main reasons. So if one guy goes or two guy go, two two men go, whatever whatever it is, um, I, I was told that was one of the reasons. But other than that, you know, it is just so surprising because the SGC guys were on such that that train, um, and I think had gotten farther than anyone thought they would. They um, did do a good. They did get farther than I think most thought that they would. Uh, they, I mean, their, their numbers of cards they were grading each month had, had become impressively big. And while still small in comparison to PSA, they were definitely, you know, they were definitely, you know, tugging on PSA's, uh, you know, uh, pants there, you know, biting it, biting it from behind a little bit, especially with certain types of cards. Yeah, they were so, they, they, listen, they were very smart in that they knew that they couldn't win the volume game. So when the fact that they had the Baltimore News Babe Ruth that they graded, the fact that they had a lot of top, top cards uh, that were in their cases, that resonated because it resonated even with casual people because those made national news stories. And you saw a picture of the card, and it's like, oh, what is that case? Yeah, I think the top three cards of all time yes. in terms of sales dollars are, are all in SGC cases, yeah. which PSA had to hate that fact. Now PSA can say that they own them, that they're all part of the same entity. So <laughs> I guess that's one way to solve it. I guess so. Well, so we'll see what happens. I, I have not heard any. There was a fake tweet from a fake me uh, that they were like getting together and they'd swap. You you could swap your PSA and yeah, I saw that. No, so that I don't. I, I don't have any information that that's true. I don't foresee something like that happening. But what I do think is interesting. So I, I I've heard two uh, schools of thought on this, and I'm curious to see which school of thought you're in. One school of thought is that this, you know, one of the big challenges that SGC has had when it comes to ultra modern cards specifically is that they're just simply, they don't command the same value in the secondary market. If you get an SGC 10, it's nowhere near as valuable as a a PSA 10. If you get an SGC 9, it's nowhere near as valuable as a PSA 9. They've had trouble closing that gap. I've heard some say they think this actually will help close the gap because it brings more legitimacy to P- to SGC now that it's under the collector's umbrella. My thought is actually the opposite on that. My thought is that I think over time, strategically, I think collectors is going to position PSA as the higher end brand. And I think they're going to position SGC as the lower end l- entry level brand for ultra modern. I think they're going to let SGC continue to run aggressive specials like they had been doing nine dollar grading on you know a whole bunch of different types of ultra modern cards i bet psa starts to get a little bit more expensive on the ultra modern side doesn't do the specials as aggressively almost separates out a little bit uh, a higher end and a lower end offering if that happens i think it keeps sgc's secondary market prices down maybe even increases the gap by making psa more valuable what camp are you in when it comes to that? I think that's right. I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, and then you can decrease the, you can increase the the price for PSA. You can decrease the massive volume, right? So you're able to at least that that addresses a greater problem, right? Too, right? So without without transferring brands, right? Let's say they don't have any personnel changes. That allows PSA to take care of their huge grading that keeps coming in on the SGC side and focus on the premium stuff on the PSA side. I, I, I think that that makes sense to me. I bet they're going to, I, I see it going that direction. There's one other kind of X factor as well, which I haven't heard anybody talk about, and that's the location of these offices. So PSA, the majority of their graders are in California, Across extremely, extremely expensive state, uh, you know, for labor, for companies, for corporations, Cost of labor, labor laws, very expensive, very difficult to navigate. They've opened up in New Jersey now as well. Um, not as, not nearly as crazy as California, but still elevated cost of living up there. Um, whereas uh, SGC is based Florida. in in Florida. South Florida. Yeah. 
much cheaper labor environment. And I know many of SGC's employees are lower, lower paid hourly workers. Um, and I, I imagine that SGC's average wage, wage base for graders is significantly less than what you know PSA is paying in New Jersey and California. That would be my guess. And so I bet there's that aspect as well where PSA is probably looking at it saying we could scale a labor base in Florida on inexpensive hourly rates, low cost of living, no state income tax, all of that type of thing, and uh, really build volume up there cost effectively and then save our California employees and maybe our New Jersey employees for higher end cards. It makes sense, too, to just spread it a little bit more across the country. I can't tell you how many people who have had like mid-range value cards say to me, I'm not going to send it to California. Are you kidding me? So even though, you know, you would think by this time you put it in a FedEx box, whether it arrives in Memphis or California, you know, who cares? Is it any more risky by f flying another 1,500 miles? Um, you know, I think having p places you know, all over, some people will go to SGC. If they're in South Carolina, they'll feel better about just going to SGC or something like that. So I think there has been pain points. I mean, I've flown something to, to, to California, you know, actually like gotten on a plane because I was scared about it. And now I can walk into New Jersey for limited things. Um, so so I, I think geography does play into this too. Were you surprised that Fanatics didn't buy SGC? I think everyone was waiting for it, like that's the thing that Fanatics needs or needs to complete the whole set. They need a grading company. Uh, but, you know, and, and some people say, well, this, this was just PSA going for the block on Hollywood Squares for people who are old enough to understand that. Um, you know, they, were, they, just, they just said, okay, like we're going we're gonna to block them from doing this because now, now, now after SGC, you know, who you, Beckett, like who are you going to buy? You know? It's got to be Beckett if they're going to go after be anybody Beckett. at this point. But yeah. Beckett's business is a little more complicated because it's not just grading, it's all the other aspects. And then they bought, you know, the distribution company as well. And and I think they bought what Southern Hobby and they've got, you know, the, obviously their magazine business and their price guide business and their marketplace business and all this kind of stuff. stuff. So I don't know if Beckett would be willing to just divest grading right. specifically if they were that would make a ton of sense to me. I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, and maybe this is it for fanatics. Maybe they're not going to be in the grading business. And 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 I, I you know, largely, I think that's fine. Like I, the idea of the manufacturer also doing the grading was always a you know always had the potential of being a little weird. Yes, a little weird for sure. Yeah. You know yeah. Yeah. So maybe they don't need it. Now, PSA has been in the news a lot recently. Another thing they were in the news for not too long ago was the fact that they refused to authenticate Anthony Richardson autographs coming out of the new prism football. They said they had questions about the authenticity of these autographs, even though, of course, Panini, you know, says these autographs are all authentic. They, you know, they do this. This is, this is not anything new, but it is a, it, it, it was particularly big news because you're talking about not only one of the top quarterbacks, one of the top cards that everyone's going after in prison football, but also you add to that the fact that because of the exclusivity that Fanatics has over quarterbacks like C.J. Stroud uh, and I think Will Levis and Bryce Young, Anthony Richardson was like the autograph to chase Correct. in in Prism, and now it's not being authenticated, or at least some of them aren't being authenticated by PSA. What should hobbyists take from this? Well, listen, I think we're now, we now, given where the industry is and how much some of these things are worth, I think the card companies should put an end to the practice of sending stickers to the agent. It's enough. It's enough. Stickers or cards should not go to the agent. You can pay someone. I think every autograph that you put in a pack should be witnessed. And you figure out how to get some sort of economy of scale to get a bunch of guys in a room, whatever it is. But it's, it's just an embarrassment because these things have happened too many times. Uh, it risk. What's the value of the risk to your brand? Do you really want to be sending these and giving them to agents? And I, I just think there's been too many stories of, you know, 
I'm getting twenty, thirty, forty dollars each. Have a friend sign them or something like that. Uh, it, it's it's not worth it for these brands, and it's been going on forever. Should the card companies just stop including as many autos? Like, should they reduce their reliance on autographs? You know, for cards in general. If they're garb, if they're complete garbage signatures, I mean, you know, if you want to get Vernon Morency to give you a V. You know, I mean, some of these autographs are garbage and I I wouldn't say stop including them because I know my kids get so excited when they get an autograph. I think I think there's value to that. It's not just creating national treasures or whatever. It's autographs are exciting, uh, but they're if they're awful and they're potentially not real, uh, then then I guess we should go get closer to stopping. Yeah, it's it it is a shame. It is a shame. I do think autographs have value. Although that said, I I kind of personally hate the sticker autographs. I know that's easier, and they can get they can get them back in you know higher volume. It's easier for them to handle. But I also, I, I I'm not sure. In most cases, I don't really the sticker autos. I don't I don't personally find that appealing. I probably would be fine with no autograph at all in those cases. It's very it's very 1998. You know haven't evolved kind of thing. You would think that in 27, 28 years that we would, we would evolve and be able to get them on cards. And then yes, that, you know, most people want it on the card. Make that another thing. Make sure that, hey, bring these people in, witness them, get it on the card, handle it. They're worried about the card because then the card, oh my God, this guy signed a million and he ruined all the corners of the card. And now we're going to be inserting those into packs. So deal with the card too. I, you know, I can't tell you, uh, you know, people are, the card companies have been so careless with pens being used for autos. Um, There's a couple that I've seen where people pull out of a pack and it's like oil on water. Like, you got to pay attention to details, guys. Uh, If you're going to make the card, if you're going to pay the guy, you know, you got to make sure you have the right pens. The guy is actually signing it. This is not that hard. And if you think it costs money to execute this type of thing, think about how much money it's costing your brand when we talk about is the autograph even real. I That makes a ton of sense to me. I agree with you, Darren, but this is not the first you know quality control issue that these companies have run into. There seems to have been a ton of, of quality control issues recently plaguing both tops and panini panini in particular you know we had an issue here in our store and of course it's been widely talked about with the new prison basketball which of course you know you got prison football with the you know potentially fake anthony richardson autographs and now you got prison basketball their other kind of flagship you know product the equivalent over in basketball and there were many boxes of that distributed without autographs and we Wild. we had yeah. We had that happen here at Cards HQ. We had, and then, a, you had, and then you had, and then you had the loaded box with like ninety-two autographs or something like that. How how do these types of problems continue to happen? And and is it fair for us to be critical of the manufacturers, or is it that the volume of this now is all so high that it's impossible for anybody to actually really get it right at this type of scale? I'll just say other businesses have plenty of scale and get it right 99.9999% of the time. I mean, uh, you know, I think I think there is there's arbitrage that goes on in the difference between the value that a box is and what can be in it. And that leads to more criminal activity, more hairiness, um, you know, so that's there. It's not like, uh, you know, you're you're making some sort of product and and it it doesn't have any secondary value. This has immense secondary value. So there's always gonna be problems in this business, again, because a box costs so much and something in the box can be that much greater. Um, But quality control, uh, like boxes missing, things happening on shipment, those those will always happen. But quality control, I think, just just has to get better. Yeah. I. I I agree. I mean, these products are not cheap. You know, people are, it's disappointing. People come in, you know, and, and, and it, it, it happens on both sides. I, my son, I uh, paid for, I made him, I make him pay for his boxes here in my card shop, but he bought 
uh, you know, a Topps product, and uh, it was about a hundred and hundred and forty dollar box, and it was not supposed cheap. to have, uh, no, not cheap, and it was supposed to have, I think, two autographs in it, and it only had one, you know, and there was no redemption or anything like that, and this kind of stuff happens to all the companies, it seems. Um, it would be nice at these price points. It would definitely be nice for all of that to be better. Yep. Um, all right, I want to sh- I want to shift here uh, to a story that. We talked about a number of months ago, the whole card porn fiasco and and unbelievable story. You did a lot of reporting on that about, you know, this guy, Juan Garcia and the scams that he was pulling off and all the craziness. And of course, he's gone basically in hiding. We don't we don't know anything about him. I don't know where he is. Yeah, we don't know where Juan Garcia is these days, but um, hopefully someday he'll he'll, you know, maybe face the law for some of the stuff he's done. But he's back in the news again, even though he's not around at all, because there was a lawsuit filed against Golden, Golden Auctions, uh, uh, by uh, by a, a family who was trying to sell, you know, a, a LeBron James exquisite card, and it was card porn that supplied information to Ken Golden, saying that the patch was was fake. It it now appears. That that actually wasn't the case. That it was a legitimate no, it, patch. It was, yeah, it was a legitimate patch. Although potentially the the original owner subbed it out because the card was destroyed, or, or because the card was not good, they subbed out the the patch. Upper deck gave it to the to the guy as a replacement, and the other one was destroyed. So that first picture doesn't mean anything, and it appears, at least as written by the L.A. Times and where it currently is in the lawsuit that you know card porn was the guy who was giving information that this was not good the bidding at the time was at 640,000 golden pulled it off you know then there was a private sale offer but basically these guys are saying uh we we bought this card for 35,000 bucks uh you know obviously now it's worth probably 250 grand but like Back then, it was worth a couple million bucks. One sold for five million, and uh, and and now card porn. It appears like card porn is the informer to Golden, saying it wasn't good, despite the fact that Upper Deck continues to stand by their letter that says it was good. Uh, so, it seems like it's a tough place for Golden right now. It do, as I look at it, it does feel to me, based upon the facts that were reported. By the LA Times, and the LA Times recently did a whole article about this that Darren, you had shared out. Uh, based on the facts that were reported in that article, it, it does feel to me like Golden might have some real liability here. Uh, and you know, I, I'm sure, I'm sure Golden has their side of the story on this as well, and I'm sure more facts will come out in court. So who knows? But I read that article. Now that we know, you know, card porn's backstory you know which back in fairness you know back then ken golden i don't think anybody knew the backstory so nobody knew not to trust this guy now everybody knows not to trust this guy and when you read it through the lens of what we know today the whole thing seems very suspicious i mean i i even read that article and came away wondering was it card porn that was doing this intentionally to try to tank the value of the card? Was he the one making the million dollar private offer, knowing the card was worth more than that, knowing that the patch was legitimate and trying to like kind of behind the scenes manipulate this whole thing into his favor somehow? Yeah, you, 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 you never know. You never know. But we knew that he was close to Golden uh, and we know what we know now. And the idea of like the picture coming into the Spiegels, the brothers who had the card, and then the guy disappearing, that sounds very card porn like. So it does. Um, so I don't know. It's it's uh it's it's I, I feel like the hobby on national stories most most of the time it's negative and here and here's and here's another one. But it was a well well written story and if Golden has a lot more to say um maybe maybe they have their hands tied because of everything that card porn became but uh they should they should say it because that story would clearly sided with the brothers yeah it's going to be interesting to see how that whole entire thing plays out what a what a crazy couple of months it's been for the hobby it just seems like there's just a 
amazing amount of news that has, you know, come out on all of these different fronts that we covered today. And I know we're not done yet. Darren, you've been teasing the fact a little <laughs> bit that there's more major news on the horizon. I know you're not going to share with us what it is today, but uh, wh- when do I need to be ready for another Darren Rovell breaking hobby news report? Uh, we're we're going to, let's say, uh, 25 days from today. Uh, we'll, we'll be, we'll be talking a lot more. Okay. And, and by, by the time this airs, it's going to be less than 25 days. So everybody, you know, in the next couple of weeks here, stay tuned. Second second week of April, second Second. week of April, everybody out there, stay tuned. Second week of April for potentially some, some big hobby breaking news from Darren Rovell and, and Darren, you, you yourself, um, I know you've been, uh, you know, kind of looking for your next uh, opportunity and kind of figuring out your path forward. And uh, you mentioned to me that I know you can't announce that either, but you've got some some part of your future in the hobby or, or related to the hobby, it sounds like. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm going to be doing a lot. More. Listen, um, I, um, I, I had a run with gambling. I had a run with sports business. Um, I think I'm going to be doing a lot more in the hobby just because – this is what I love. You know, I spend so much of my free time, which isn't much, <laughs> like all of my free time on auctions and everything. And I've collected for so long and I feel like it's such a part of my identity uh, that I feel like I have to do more of this. So, so people should expect uh, me to do a lot more reporting in this space. Good. Well, we are looking forward to that for sure. Let's end on this. You you have your your hands in a lot of different ventures. I've been seeing you post a lot recently on on your social media about your beverage company, and I know you've been having a lot of success with the expansion of that. So for folks not not even maybe knowing that you're involved in that business, tell everybody a little bit about it. Yeah, and Jeff, you talk about you know entrepreneurial stuff all the time. Uh, you know, we have a, a brand called Kickstand, which is a spicy canned cocktail. You know, everything about me has been you know just try to get into a niche and own it and. Um, you know, so we're, our cans are black in a sea of white. Um, we're under flavored instead of over flavored and we offer spice when no other brand offers spice. Just, it's important. Uh, I don't know if you want to go deep niche, you know, like I've gone in the past. Um, but like, you know, having your own take and being on your Island, uh, while it's sometimes it's harder in the sports card space, liquidity is sometimes harder. Say if you do tickets versus cards, um, in the end, you if you're in a niche, I think I've felt actually more comfortable surviving and being in a niche versus uh, you know being out there with the masses. So kickstand's just another another beverage, another idea, another another thing that I'm doing that uh, we're doing really well, and we're going to come into a couple states soon, uh, a couple more states, and uh, it's it's exciting. It's amazing to think something in your head, and then as you know, just you know the products there. Super cool. All right. Well, if anybody out there sees kickstand in their local grocery store, wherever it may be sold, make sure to pick up some and uh, give it, give it a try for sure. Awesome. Darren. Well, we're going to let you go today, but we're going to have you back on here in a few weeks when uh, the big breaking news breaks, whatever that might be. We'll, we'll, we'll have you back on soon to discuss that for sure. You got it. That was an awesome interview with Darren. And I know we all want to learn more about that breaking news. So make sure you are subscribed to this show everywhere you could subscribe. The full length videos of this show are under the Jeff Wilson show channel on YouTube. Please subscribe there and please also subscribe on Spotify and on Apple podcasts. So you are always getting the latest shows and news and information from the Jeff Wilson show because there's a lot to tune in for. Thanks for watching and we'll see you with our next one.